This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little Lame Prince by Miss Mullock. Chapter 10 Did Prince Dolor become a great king? Was he, though little more than a boy, the father of his people, as all kings ought to be? Did his reign last long, long and happy? And what were the principal events of it, as chronicled in the history of No Man's Land? Why, if I were to answer all these questions, I should have to write another book. And I'm tired, children, tired, as grown-up people sometimes are, though not always with play. Besides, I have a small person belonging to me, who, though she likes extremely to listen to the word-of-mouth story of this book, grumbles much at the writing of it, and has run about the house clapping her hands with joy when Mama told her that it was nearly finished. But that is neither here nor there. I have related as well as I could the history of Prince Dolor, but with the history of No Man's Land I am as yet unacquainted. If anybody knows it, perhaps he or she will kindly write it all down in another book, but mine is done. However, of this I am sure, that Prince Dolor made an excellent king. Nobody ever does anything less well, not even the commonest duty of common daily life, for having such a godmother as the little old woman clothed in grey, whose name is, well, I leave you to guess. Nor, I think, is anybody less good, less capable of both work and enjoyment in afterlife, for having been a little unhappy in his youth, as the prince had been. I cannot take upon myself to say that he was always happy now. Who is? Or that he had no cares. Just show me the person who was quite free from them. But whenever people worried and bothered him, as they did sometimes, with state etiquette, state squabbles and the like, setting up themselves and pulling down their neighbors, he would take refuge in that upper room which looked out on the beautiful mountains, and laying his head on his godmother's shoulder, become calmed and at rest. Also she helped him out of any difficulty which now and then occurred, for there never was such a wise old woman. When the people of no man's land raised the alarm, as sometimes they did, for what people can exist without a little fault-finding, and began to cry out, Unhappy is the nation whose king is a child, she would say to him gently, You are a child. Accept the fact. Be humble. Be teachable. Lean upon the wisdom of others till you have gained your own. He did so. He learned how to take advice before attempting to give it to obey before he could righteously command. He assembled round him all the good and wise of his kingdom, laid all its affairs before them, and was guided by their opinions until he had maturely formed his own. This he did sooner than anybody would have imagined who did not know of his godmother and his travelling cloak, two secret blessings which, though many guessed at, nobody quite understood. Nor did they understand why he so loved the little upper room, except that it had been his mother's room from the window of which, as people remembered now, she had used to sit for hours watching the beautiful mountains. Out of that window he used to fly, not very often. As he grew older, the labors of state prevented the frequent use of his traveling cloak. Still, he did use it sometimes. Only now it was less for his own pleasure and amusement than to see something or investigate something for the good of the country. But he prized his godmother's gift as dearly as ever. It was a comfort to him in all his vexations, an enhancement of all his joys. It made him almost forget his lameness, which was never cured. However, the cruel things which had once foreboded of him did not happen. His misfortune was not such a heavy one after all. It proved to be of much less inconvenience, even to himself, than had been feared. A council of eminent surgeons and mechanicians invented for him a wonderful pair of crutches, with the help of which... Though he never walked easily or gracefully, he did manage to walk, so as to be quite independent. And such was the love his people bore him, that they never heard the sound of his crutches on the marble palace floors without a leap of the heart, for they knew that good was coming to them whenever he approached. Thus, though he never walked in processions, never reviewed his troops mounted on a magnificent charger, nor did any of the things which make a show monarch so much appreciated, he was able for all the duties and a great many of the pleasures of his rank. When he held his livies, not standing, but seated on a throne ingeniously contrived to hide his infirmity, the people thronged to greet him. When he drove out through the city streets, shouts followed him wherever he went. Every countenance brightened as he passed, 
and his own, perhaps, was the brightest of all. First, because, accepting his affliction as inevitable, he took it patiently. Second, because, being a brave man, he bore it bravely, trying to forget himself, and live out of himself, and in and for other people. Therefore, other people grew to love him so well that I think hundreds of his subjects might have been found who were almost ready to die for their poor lame king. He never gave them a queen. When they implored him to choose one, he replied that his country was his bride, and he desired no other. But perhaps the real reason was that he shrank from any change, and that no wife in all the world would have been found so perfect, so lovable, so tender to him, in all his weaknesses, as his beautiful old godmother. His twenty-four other godfathers and godmothers, or as many of them as were still alive, crowded round him as soon as he ascended the throne. He was very civil to them all, but adopted none of the names they had given him, keeping to the one by which he had always been known, though it had now almost lost its meaning, for King Dolor was one of the happiest and cheerfulest men alive. He did a good many things, however, unlike most men and most kings, which a little astonished his subjects. First, he pardoned the condemned woman who had been his nurse, and ordained that from henceforth there should be no such thing as punishment of death in no man's land. All capital criminals were to be sent to perpetual imprisonment in Hopeless Tower, and the plain round about it, where they could do no harm to anybody, and might, in time, do a little good, as the woman had done. Another surprise he shortly afterward gave the nation. He recalled his uncle's family, who had fled away in terror to another country, and restored them to all their honors in their own. By and by he chose the eldest son of his eldest cousin, who had been dead a year, and had him educated in the royal palace as the heir to the throne. This little prince was a quiet, unobtrusive boy, so that everybody wondered at the king's choosing him when there were so many more. But as he grew into a fine young fellow, good and brave, they agreed that the king had judged more wisely than they. "'Not to lame prince, either,' His Majesty observed one day, watching him affectionately, for he was the best runner, the highest leaper, the keenest and most active sportsman in the country. One cannot make one's self, but one can sometimes help a little in the making of somebody else. It is well. This was said, not to any of his great lords and ladies, but to a good old woman, his first homely nurse whom he had sought for far and wide, and at last found in her cottage among the beautiful mountains. He sent for her to visit him once a year, and treated her with great honor until she died. He was equally kind, though somewhat less tender, to his other nurse, who, after receiving her pardon, returned to her native town, and grew into a great lady, and, I hope, a good one. But as she was so grand a personage now, any little faults she had did not show. Thus King Dolores' reign passed year after year, long and prosperous. Whether he were happy, as happy as a king, is a question no human being can decide. But I think he was, because he had the power of making everybody about him happy, and did it, too. Also because he was his godmother's godson, and could shut himself up with her whenever he liked, in that quiet little room in the view of the beautiful mountains, which nobody else ever saw or cared to see. They were too far off, and the city lay so low. But they were there all the time. No change ever came to them, and I think... At any day throughout his long reign, the king would sooner have lost his crown than have lost sight of the beautiful mountains. In course of time, when the little prince, his cousin, was grown into a tall young man, capable of all the duties of a man, his majesty did one of the most extraordinary acts ever known in a sovereign beloved by his people and prosperous in his reign. He announced that he wished to invest his heir with the royal purple, at any rate for a time, while he himself went away on a distant journey whither he had long desired to go. Everybody marveled, but nobody opposed him. Who could oppose the good king who was not a young king now? And besides, the nation had a great admiration for the young regent, and possibly a lurking pleasure in change. So there was a fixed day when all the people whom it would hold assembled in the great square of the capital, to see the young prince installed solemnly in his new duties, and undertaking his new vows. He was a very fine young fellow, tall and straight as a poplar tree, with a frank, handsome face. A great deal handsomer than the king, some people said, but others thought differently. However, as his majesty sat on his throne, 
with his gray hair falling from underneath his crown, and a few wrinkles showing in spite of his smile. There was something about his countenance which made his people, even while they shouted, regard him with a tenderness mixed with awe. He lifted up his thin, slender hand, and there came a silence over the vast crowd immediately. Then he spoke, in his own accustomed way, using no grand words, but saying what he had to say in the simplest fashion, though with a clearness that struck their ears like the first song of a bird in the dusk of the morning. My people, I am tired. I want to rest. I have had a long reign and done much work, at least as much as I was able to do. Many might have done it better than I, but none with a better will. Now I leave it to others. I am tired, very tired. Let me go home. There arose a murmur, of content or discontent none could well tell. Then it died down again, and the assembly listened silently once more. I am not anxious about you, my people, my children, continued the king. You are prosperous and at peace. I leave you in good hands. The prince regent will be a fitter king for you than I. No, 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 rose the universal shout and those who had sometimes found fault with him shouted louder than anybody. But he seemed as if he heard them not. Yes, yes, said he, as soon as the tumult had a little subsided. And his voice sounded firm and clear, and some very old people, who boasted of having seen him as a child, declared that his face took a sudden change, and grew as young and sweet as that of the little Prince Dolor. Yes, I must go. It is time for me to go. Remember me sometimes, my people, for I have loved you well, and I am going a long way, and I do not think I shall come back any more. He drew a little bundle out of his breast pocket, a bundle that nobody had ever seen before. It was small and shabby looking, and tied up with many knots, which untied themselves in an instant. With a joyful countenance, he muttered over it a few half-intelligible words. Then, so suddenly that even those nearest to his majesty could not tell how it came about, the king was away, away, floating right up in the air, upon something, they knew not what, except that it appeared to be as safe and pleasant as the wings of a bird. And after him sprang a bird, a dear little lark, rising from whence no one could say, since larks do not usually build their nests in the pavement of city squares. But there it was, a real lark, singing far over their heads, louder and clearer and more joyful, as it vanished farther into the blue sky. Shading their eyes and straining their ears, the astonished people stood until the whole vision disappeared like a speck in the clouds, the rosy clouds that overhung the beautiful mountains. King Dolor was never again beheld or heard of in his own country, but the good he had done there lasted for years and years. He was long missed and deeply mourned. At least, so far as anybody could mourn one who was gone in such a happy journey. Whether he went, or who went with him, it is impossible to say. But I myself believe that his godmother took him on his traveling cloak to the beautiful mountains. What he did there, or where he is now, who can tell? I cannot. But one thing I am quite sure of, that wherever he is, he is perfectly happy. And so, when I think of him, am I. End of chapter 10